Welcome to another episode. Excited to talk to today's guest. I don't know. I want to hear your story. I'm really excited to hear it. I saw you on Instagram. I think it was. And um, yes. yes, yes. And found your email and emailed you and asked you to be on. So thank you for being here. I'll introduce Thanks you now, Jeff, yeah. Jeff Forney. Welcome here. Welcome. Thank Jeff. You. Yeah. Thanks for having me. Um, so I guess I can dig right in. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Tell us about you. <laughs> yes. I was born in the, you know, in the later stages of the sixties baby scoop era, uh, born in San Francisco and my, uh, biological mother um, was, you know, typical. She was Catholic, unwed, college student at U of A. Um, she went to, uh, she's from San Francisco, went back up there to paint for a semester. And I was born in November. And then she went back to school and finished up kind of at that December graduation time because she missed that spring semester of being pregnant. But um, she, uh, yeah, she relinquished me and I went to uh, see, I was in foster care for about six weeks. Uh, CHS was where I was uh, adopted out of in Oakland. And about six weeks of age, I was home with my parents in Moraga, California, East Bay. And um from there, I, you know, had a wonderful, loving family. My parents also adopted a, my younger sister, who's 18 months younger than me. And uh, we had a, it was a loving family, always knew we were adopted. Uh, occasionally, it would come up like, you know, what did it mean again? Or it's like, well, we chose you, we want you to be in our family. And so it was always, um, you know, wanted we were always felt that we were wanted but you know as an adoptee there's also this knowledge that you're not biologically connected to your parents so there's this thing in your head what why what why and I think it wasn't until my third year of college at Chico and I came home for a weekend drove home the two and a half hours to Moraga and said you know mom dad I think I might want to look for my biological parents what, what kind of stirred that going for you? I, you know, I think I was just kind of, I think, you know, schooling, junior high, high school is one thing. College, you're now on your own. You're creating your new, your own friend groups. And you're not in this group of people that you were like friends with since kindergarten. And now I'm a senior in high school and we're all graduate. Like, I don't know, I think I just kind of did a lot of growing during that time. And um I told my folks and they said, we're fully supportive of you doing that. Um, and I told my mom, you know, I just want to tell them I'm doing well and that'll be it. It'll be okay. You know, that I'm okay. And she goes, I don't think it's going to be that easy. I think you're going to have a little more, you know, there's going to be more to it than just saying, you know, that uh, thanks for having me and just want to let you know I'm alive. Um, and she the, was right. The, conver the conversation's big that your mom was able to do yeah. that and have that. Yeah, no, my parents, and later on, I've been, uh, we'll get into it, but I've been working on a documentary project interviewing adoptees in reunion. And, my, and I discovered through interviewing, interviewing my mom, she said that we actually set money aside in case we passed away, that there was money allocated to each of our children to find their biological parents. So they were thinking, they were thinking. But um, so I, you know, it, it was tough having that conversation because as you know, telling your adoptive parents, my parents, that I wanted to look, it makes it, you know, makes you look ungrateful, makes you look, you feel like you're cheating on your parents in a way that you want to find your, you know, biological parents. But I really wanted to solve that mystery of my origin. I just needed to know how did I get here? Who was it? You know, because growing up, I remember a dinner party and my parents, I was playing little league and I wasn't aware of who each base, baseball player was, but one of my parents' friends at the dinner table said, Jeff, what's it like to be adopted? You and Jennifer, you're adopted and your parents wanted you. And 
I said, it's great. It's awesome. And who knows, maybe even Willie Mays is my father, you know? And they're like, ha ha ha, Willie Mays is not your father. There's no chance of Willie Mays being your father, <laughs> but we applaud you loving this, you know, this whole adoption situation. Anyway, so I, it was a little reminder like, oh yeah, yeah, probably Willie Mays is not my father, but you know, these little reminders through life, but um, I and what, how were your teenage years? Like, just everything sort of was fine. Yeah, it was your pretty sister good. Was had a lot of friends, played sports. I think my sister might have. Um, I think I th- actually, I think both of us handled it pretty well. I mean, looking back, there's some things that maybe, um, yeah, that I think each of us might have been dealing with, but I, I really, we had a great childhood. Um, one time playing out with the neighbors, uh, 12 years old, maybe like sixth, seventh grade. And someone said, oh, well, Jeff, you're adopted. So blah, blah, blah. You know, just every once in a while, there'd be a little zinger that you're like, huh, you know, screw you, you know, or, but I, I really, it didn't really affect too much. I think, I think I went into the search feeling very good about myself. I had had a lot of success in sports and, you know, had friends and, uh, you know, there wasn't anything that I would say was a, an issue for me at the time. Um, I I do remember though, when I was four years old, one, five years old, we did, my parents wanted to go to the city and I was afraid to go to the city because I didn't want to get left there and upset my parents. They're like, we're not going to leave you anywhere. We love you. But there was that already, that idea, there was a Did you freeze? Did he yep. freeze? Okay. Yep. <laughs> but, Do you want yeah. To- but okay. Um, Wait, you froze. For, was- you froze for one second. Oh. So you that the the possibility of being left in San Francisco, you realize in retrospect these were like abandonment things yes. that would pop yes. up. Gotcha. Yeah. Yeah. So I knew, I knew there was a little bit of that there, but really for the most part, I was living my life, doing my studies and had a, you know, pretty normal, typical childhood life. And it was great. And then I went off to college and then I had this conversation with my parents. And so then when I get back to school, I joined this group called Alma, Adoptees Liberty Movement Association. And now I think there's only one chapter in Colorado. And for the most part, they've disappeared. But I would do that on Wednesday nights. It was like AA for adoptees, seven to nine. I would go do that. We would talk about people having found their birth parents. And then we would also, uh, part of it was search. And, you know, how are you coming along, Jeff, on your search? I did get very lucky <clears throat> in the beginning. I knew, so, I knew her a birth date and I knew a middle name. And for some reason, I just started going to uh, marriage records of California and uh, not the best sleuthing at that point. And then, uh, Leela Hicks, who ran our meeting, she was the den mother. She said, why don't you write to San Francisco children's hospital where you were born? See what, see what happens. So I said, Oh, great idea. So I wrote a note and I got back. They said, Hey, thanks for your inquiry. Here's all your info, except it was exacto knifed out. It looked like Swiss cheese. It was nine pages. You know, I've got it here and I, I should probably break it up. I, and I was looking through it like, oh my God. Jeff, 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 Jeff. Somebody that used that big paper cleaver that you would cut. To, am, I, am I okay? Freezing. <laughs> am I, it kept okay? freezing. Uh, go back so you get the you're you're going through the nine pages going through the nine pages on the very last page it somebody wasn't cut properly and it was it could it said taylor baby so with taylor baby i uh so so, someone like miscut that's all that's why they they miscut this little bit (laughs) and i'm not sure if that was a uh sometimes you have people on the inside underground adoption railroad style you know you don't know maybe somebody you know on the papers you know most likely it said this baby is for adoption 
So maybe they gave a clue. I don't know. I took it back to my group on that Wednesday night meeting. And she said, this is something. Why don't you write back? and uh, see if you can get it, the whole thing. So we wrote back, I had my girlfriend in college and she wrote it and it said, hi, I am, oh, and it said, I am Ms. Lynn Taylor. So I had the middle name from the non-IDing info that CHS gave me. I had the last name Taylor that they fucked up with. <laughs> and then I, we wrote back and I got the same nine pages with everything. And I was like, ah. I was like, holy shit, I have all of my info now. So, <clears throat> wow. so I took it back to the Wednesday night meeting and Leela said, well, we do have an officer at Chico, in, in the city of Chico, who is adopted and he will run social security numbers for adoptees. Shouldn't be doing it. Uh, so that's an so, in. <laughs> but we'll do it for adoptees. So... <laughs> She said, get a pen and paper out. I'm calling you back in five minutes. And literally, you know, you know, she called me back and said, um, she's in Portland. This is her address. This is her name, all the info. And so I, I got it in about six months. All this beginning, this process from beginning to end, it was six months. So then it was the next point of like, all right, when am I going to call her? So I spent a couple of days talking to friends, talking to my girlfriend about it. And then I, you know, I went into my room in my apartment. I actually took one of those Radio Shack phone tappers and I put a TDK 90 minute tape into my tape player <laughs> and I recorded and you can hear me like calling and then it's busy. So I hang up, I go back out, roommate hands me a beer. I crack the beer. My friends are giving me a little shoulder massage. I get back in there, mofo. <laughs> Go get it. I'm like, all right, come back in. I go in and the phone is not busy. My half sister picks up the phone. I didn't know at the time. And I said, hi, is Bar, you know, is this, you know, I'll, I'll keep her name out of it, but is, you know, blah, blah in. And uh, she said, sure, one second. So then my birth mother answered the phone and I, we had been trained back in, this is 1991, this is October of 91. And so we've been trained, you wanna get yourself in that door. So you might say something that they're gonna hang up the phone. So uh, this is the way our, our den mother taught us. She said, you know, I, I called and said, hi, I'm calling long distance. Is there any chance, I have some great and wonderful news for for you but any chance i can give you my phone number in case we get disconnected and she goes uh sure what's your number i said 916 you know whatever my chico number was and she goes okay so who is this i go i have some great and wonderful news and are you five <laughs> foot eight, five foot six whatever she said yes but what, 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 what's going on <laughs> i said well on the day of november 30th 1968 you and i shared my birth and that's then how you she, said it. That's how I said it. I've, I've got, uh, I, I, I've got I, some great and wonderful news. <laughs> I, I'm yeah, giving I you know, some Genzo knives wanted, or something. Yeah. I just wanted her to stay on long enough so I could say something. And I was really happy that I got my phone number onto the tablet yeah. in the kitchen in case she hung up the phone. Maybe two days later says, well, shit, that was my son. I should call him back. So so we talked for, uh, we went through that 90 minute TV. How did she, tape. like when you said that we shared, a, we shared a birth. Uh, how did she, she silence for 30 seconds and you can hear her going, oh. you know, you, you can hear all this. And then she finally says, you know, uh, I, I named you David. What is your name now again? And I said, uh -huh. I'm Jeff. And she was like, wow, I can't believe this. And we talked and where did you grow up? And what, what are your parents like? And, and we just got into it for a couple hours and uh, we made arrangements for me to go up to Portland to go visit. Did your half sister know that was there or did, did she find out? Well, she, uh, that was the interesting thing. She, she said, give me a few days. You know, we, we talked for about a week or so, and then we made a plan in two weeks to go up. And she said, also, I need to give my kids, I need to let my son know he's not the oldest, mm -hmm. let my younger daughter know that she's got an older brother. 
Uh, my husband always knew, uh, not related to me, uh, but I do need to let some other cousins, you were a secret. You know, this Catholic family wasn't going to let that one in. So um, I said, all right. And we made plans. They, she bought me a ticket, flew up to Portland. These are the days where the person's at the gate, you know, yeah. they're <laughs> right there. So I'm walking, she said, I'll be wearing a red blazer. And I go through the, you know, the breezeway. And there's a woman in a red blazer. And I was like, holy shit. Like, you know, and gave her a hug and we talked a little bit there. And then she says, you know, let's go. Um, we're going to go back to the house. The kids are waiting. Um, and there's going to be, and then after that, my uh, cousin's coming over and his wife and a couple other people. So I said, okay. And we actually kind of, she said, you know, let's go. There's, this was the age of the microbreweries were taking over the Pacific Northwest. Yeah. We went and got a, pint of beer somewhere and we kind of discussed the whole thing got in the car went to the house met my half brother and sister um at the time I'm 22 and maybe and were you staying with her I stayed with her in a room (laughs) there at the house yeah and I was big actually yeah and I was like mm, nine years older than the next eight or nine years older Anyway, yeah, went to the house, met those guys, and he had some of his basketball buddies. My half brother had some friends come by. They wanted to see, like, wow, you got an old brother, dude. Let's go see what this guy's all about. So he must have been like 13 or he something. He was 13, wow. 14, and I think Probably my thought it was kind of cool. was like 12, something like that. So yeah, so I met he and his buddies, and then then some of the family starts coming. So we're just sitting around the kitchen island. And people keep coming in, a lot of hugs, a lot of crying, a lot of talking, um, and just had a wonderful, you know, reunion. That evening was great. The next day, I was only there for two and a half days, and it was great. And as we all know, the reunion, uh, the reunion honeymoon is great for that month or so. And then you start to go, why the fuck was I giving up? How, you know, now... Now the question has come, you know, it's not the, you know, there's a lot of that as a friend of mine has uh, coined it, that reunion porn out there where, Hey, let's pull away the car. Here's your mom. Here's your dad. Ta-da. That's, that's just the beginning. The right. I was just going to say that exactly. That's base camp Mount Everest. The real work is when you climb that bitch. So just, just meeting your birth parents. Mm-hmm. Yeah. That's the easy part. Now you got to climb it. So um i like a reunion porn yeah use that. yeah oh every it's all over the place but it that's is not where the real work is the real work is not in meeting them i mean it took work to get there but the real introspection work happens afterwards so mm-hmm. um that's kind of what my projects emphasizing and working on it how's it inform your life once you you know meet your biological parents so Anyway, so my birth mother knew where my birth father was. She hadn't spoken to him in a while, but she knew where his mother was. And did he know about you? He knew about me. Yeah. Like back then she told him that that she was pregnant. And he kind of it was a one night thing and he helped her out. You know, they weren't dating. You know, it was just kind of a one of those things. But he did, you know. He was somewhat around, but for the most part, my birth mother went back up to, you know, the Bay Area and had had me. And then she, you know, I was relinquished to child services or wherever you go. And she went back to her house in Palo Alto for until the next semester started. And um, and but then I, yeah, I found my biological father. And the first thing he said when I called him, you know, and, and did you this, say the same thing? I've got some wonderful, <laughs> great and wonderful. I'm have to use that. You're not going to believe it. <laughs> yeah. So no, I did Take not. Take my and number, this, please, in case you get disconnected. Yeah. Yeah. I'm trying to and sell this, you something. <laughs> yeah, I know. I know. But at this point, I'm living in New York. After college, after I graduated college, I fell into uh, modeling, and I was modeling in New York. Lived in Paris. Lived in Milan. Did runway shows. Did all this stuff. I'm in New York and I have a job um, in Arizona 
So I'm down there and I, I had called the, my biological father uh, after I met my birth mother like six months later and he said, well, you're not looking for money, are you? I'm like, no, oh. asshole, I'm not looking for fucking money. What a dick. But anyway, I, I said, listen, next, whenever I get down to you know Arizona, am I frozen? Or no, no, you're good. Uh, when I get down to Arizona, when I get down there sometime, I'll look you up. So anyway, the guy showed up in a car. He had this Pontiac Sunfire, the it's convertible, and it was like already in 1994 when I met him. It was already like a 10 year old car, 15 year old car. It looked like it hadn't gotten a bath since he bought it. And the the uh, the convertible was broken, and. So it was always down. So you're I was hot as hell driving around when we went to go try to find some food. And Arizona. the windows were broken, but they were broken up. So you're driving in, I'm driving in a, you know, a car with the windows up, tops down. I'm like, this is all fucked up. Anyway, so we, I, and he didn't look like he had much, much dough. So I take him to, I never heard of it before, but we go to P.F. Chang's, we go to dinner. <laughs> And I learned about him there and, you know, not, I wasn't impressed to say the least, you know, I wasn't very impressed with his uh, thoughts. Uh, yeah. The guy was a little racist, a little bit of an asshole, a little bit of a chauvinist, you know, if I didn't know him, he probably would have been better with a punch in the face, but I was like, I'm gonna let you go with that. <laughs> but <clears throat> anyway, so I met that guy. That we, guy. That guy. Did you have any resemblance but, with them or anything I mean, like I, that? Yeah, yeah. But I have more with my birth mother <laughs> yeah. than I do with him. And we've and, stayed in touch. I did reach out to him. Um, I haven't talked to him in 10 years, but I did reach out to him about six months ago. And his, and I know his niece and uh, his brother's kids, they came to visit New York, but back in the 2000s. But anyway, I reached out. She said, well, I'll let my dad know and he'll contact his brother let steve uh sorry without the name but let, let him know that you're looking and then she said well i've heard back from your birth father and evidently he's very happy with the relationship as it is and i was like there is no relationship okay so <laughs> that that's it so you know i haven't talked to him in 10 years anyway and six months ago that came up so i i it's really neither here nor there. The guy really wasn't much of a much anything anyway. But did uh, he have other kids? Do you have siblings? He did. For him? He did. Yeah, he got married after me, and he had a kid like six years after me, and then he got divorced two years after that. So his daughter barely knows him because he left the house. The last time she talked to him was when she was thirteen. She told her dad she was going out for eighth grade cheerleading. And he said, why would you do that? You're fat. So, oh. she said, so she went like this. She hasn't talked to him since. She, she asked me, how is he doing? Because I won't talk with him. So when I came into her life, she said, oh, that's amazing. You saw, what's he up to? I go, oh, you know, probably the same bullshit when you were with him. Like, you know, <laughs> he, he, the guy had a, a real nobody. So anyway, she, she asked me what's going on. I, what, I'm the adopted relinquished child and you're trying to get info about your dad? Just let you know what kind of a guy he is. But yeah, anyway. Sorry, that, you're making me laugh. I don't no, yeah, no, there, hey, we have to have a little bit of you humor have in to have all humor. of this. Yes. We're the most unique form of human being on this planet, the relinquished child. Like we, we have to laugh. So, um, so, uh, so yeah, so I- that's where that relationship is with him. And then, uh, yeah, so, the, so from there, the, there was some, there was some tough years with my birth mother, a lot of, it, it's still tough. There's a lot of, uh, up until, and she actually came to visit about two months ago and she, you know, her new thing, you know, she, the whole plan was, and on the papers, it says baby for adoption, and her parents took her out of school, put her in a little apartment that she was going to paint and get her hippie on. And then all of a sudden, she, she now, the story she's telling me now, which is, I think, a coping mechanism for herself, is that actually, I didn't want to give you up and you were stolen out of the mm -hmm. hospital. 
And I was like, oh, so you had no intention. So, so, so everybody knew your cousins that were supposedly weren't in the mix. Everybody knew that you were going to have me and you wanted to keep me. She goes, well, no, I kind of made that decision, that choice after I had you there in the hospital. I said, well, okay, let's go with that idea. You had me and you wanted to keep me. So did you notify people that you were keeping me? She says, well, I, I couldn't really. I'm like, well, when I was kidnapped out of the hospital, did you go look for me? She goes, because I, from what I know, you got, you got the car service and you went back down to Palo Alto with your mom. So if I was something you were trying to keep, I think there would have been more search going on. And she's, well, she said, well, I wasn't allowed to use the phone at the house, so I couldn't call anybody. I go, well, maybe a dime and a walk to the 7-Eleven? Well, I didn't know where that was. I go, okay, all right, I'm gonna leave it at it. And sometimes I think biological birth mothers, birth fathers, it's so hard to accept what has been done or what they chose to do or for better or for lack of choice, what they, what ended up transpiring, it's hard for them to deal with. So mm -hmm. it's been a lot of times, a lot of jumping around as to what happened and all that, you know, cause uh, I, I did propose the idea. I said, well, when you had your son after me, if he had been stolen out of the hospital, would you have just gotten in the car service and gone back to Palo Alto? I mean, to uh, Palo Alto? I, you know, your son's with you. So somehow you managed to keep him. So, you know, I, but I don't press her too much on it because I know she's in a spot where that's how she copes. And right. It does sound like that. She's grappling it, with guilt yeah. and shame. Yeah. It was so prevalent, you know, especially Catholic. I mean, it was such a prevalent thing right. in that baby scoop era, the shaming of the unwed yeah. mothers. Yeah. It was a lot of shaming and I get it. And there's a lot of shame in this whole thing, but at the same time, we are, I try to, you know, talk with her and I, and trying to help with other people. I sometimes I have meetings here at the house with adoptees, but it, the more we can take that shame out of there, mm -hmm. the more we can of course. Take, we're yeah. all innocent people here from the adoptive parent. They want a child innocent me. I'm an adopted child, innocent. Uh, my birth mother, I don't blame her for anything. I would like her to acknowledge responsibility. I don't think it's going to happen, but I don't blame her for anything. That's what was going on at that time. And it's the best she could do. You know, we're all innocent people in this weird constellation of adoption. So, um, so going forward, I'm working in New York and I start getting into after about 12 years of working in front of the camera, I get behind the camera and I start shooting a lot of, you know, at first I'm at CBGB's and Coney Island High shooting punk rock bands. None of my friends made it, but they're all doing that Green Day type punk rock, cool stuff. Anyway, uh, start shooting more and more, get a career going, come to LA with my wife. And it just so happens that, um, I have a job shooting Ray Liotta. So uh, Ray comes over to the house. I have a home studio here. And Ray uses the restroom, comes out. And he's like, hey, yo, what, what's up with the black rocks in your sink? Those like smooth black rocks. I go, ah, my birth mother's kind of a hippie. Uh, she's supposed to bring good energies to the house. And he goes, he said something to the effect of like, you just said the magic words, you're adopted and so am I. And I was like, wow, I can't believe, what? like, tell me, did you find, did you find your, your birth parents? And he's like, yep. And we got into a three hour conversation, mm -hmm. shooting, talking, went on a location that I had already sourced, came back, driving the car with Ray, just shooting the shit with Ray Liotta getting his story and sharing mine. And it was amazing. It was an amazing, amazing time. And, uh, and probably for the next five or six years after that shoot, it was a great story at a cocktail party, sharing it. And then one day I'm talking to my wife 
maybe even driving home from one of these parties, said, you know, there's other people that have these stories and there's healing in sharing and people getting to, when I heard Ray talk about, it, I could identify with a lot of things he was dealing with and made me feel better, make, like there's something here. So I started photographing adoptees in reunion, uh, black and white photos. I started with some other, uh, some, I know quite a few adoptees here in LA and I was able to get some shoots done. And then I did one of myself, uh, self-portrait of myself, one of my birth mother and one of my mom. And when you see that triptych, I always kind of fit my family. I, I was the one that, you know, in the church directory, I got my hand on my mom's shoulder and I was the blonde haired dude that looked just like my blonde haired mom and my blonde haired sister and my dad was tall. We kind of really fit, you know, even though everybody knew, like you would think that we were, we were just a, a non-adopted family, so to speak. But um, so I started this project shooting this stuff and a friend of mine who's at an ad agency said, you know what, why don't we think about filming you as you're going on this journey? Like mm. this rock and roll photographer out there, you're not really the typical guy to be doing this, like to have this message of a, like, let's, let's, let's do this. So we were able to, over the weekends, we were able to get cameras and get some guys to operate them. And we went to San Diego, San Francisco, got my mom's interview, got my birth mother's interview in Oregon, got stuff in LA, um, all over California, Oregon. And um, putting all this stuff together, we now, we have a lot more to go, we, you know, but I've got about 46, 47 hours of footage. How many, how many people is that? I've got six families and six stories yeah. and I probably need another 300 or so. So I'm still working on that <laughs> and I've gotten a few more but um, during COVID, but uh, what I've got in my sizzle reel right now, it's about, about six different stories in there. And um, I was talking with another friend of mine and he said, you know, why don't you think about reaching out to Ray Liotta and try to complete the circle? And I said, that might be a good idea. So we had a friend that kind of knew some people and Ray uh, said, please send over the, the uh, sizzle reel and I'd like to know more, more about it. And he watched it and was like, wow, this is incredible. I love it. And so he had me, get, he wanted me to give him a call. I called him and he said, you know what? I'm going to blow the balls off this thing. I want to just take it out. Like I'm going to, I'm going to share everything. I'm going to share everything. I'm going to just blow the lid off it. And we're going to, we're going to, um, we're going to do this. And I'm like, this is great. We'll, we'll get an interview. He's like, well, I, I do need to, you know, head out for work. Oh, Jeff, wait, for... wait, he was wait, you more, 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 a little gung ho. Wait, hold on. You froze. Yeah, so go back to, yeah. uh, he wanted to do, he's like, yeah, we're going to do this lost that yeah. part we're gonna do this we're gonna i'm gonna say i'm gonna um you know i'm gonna just give the whole story i'm gonna give him the whole story i'm gonna just you know i think this is what you're doing is great i'm gonna just tell it all i go that's that's great let's do it and uh he goes off for a job comes back two weeks later and he's had a change of mind uh, you know he is a little more reticent about giving everything he's like you know my work i'm a i'm a mobster i you know this is my i don't know I, you know i think he's thinking could he see robert nero like you know spilling his you know vulnerable guts uh to this whole thing so he was more uh hesitant and um so then i uh so we said okay let's let's you know hold on ray and let's think about this for a sec. Um, why don't we try to do a dinner? And let's, let me just kind of, I'm going to like to bring in my friend who's, who's been helping me. Uh, he's a producer. We're going to take you out to dinner. And then COVID happens. 
So dinner doesn't happen. But one of the interviews I do get during COVID is Daryl McDaniels from Run DMC. He's, mm-hmm. he's DMC. And um, so I spend six hours with Daryl cruising around his, his house and uh, neighborhood in Queens. We go to Harlem and Daryl McDaniels is for what an incredible guy. And uh, anyway, we got his whole wonderful story and I shared the whole Ray thing. He says, I see Ray. I see Ray, a lot of functions. You know, he, he donates to the Felix organization that I started with Sheila Jaffe. I see him. We can get him. We can get him. So I said, all right, let's, he goes, you know, that dinner you want to do, put me in on that dinner, make it a party of four. We'll get right. So I said, Daryl, that would be amazing. Thank you. I would, this would be fantastic. And he said, well, I'm going to be out there in April and, and he was here. Unfortunately, I had a job shooting somewhere else. He said, well, I'll be back again this summer. Let's be, you know, thinking about that. Um, and Ray didn't, you know, had an unfortunate situation. And uh, so it's not going to happen with Ray, but that doesn't stop what we're doing. And it was. Um, and the reason, was, like he was like the turn. Yeah. There. But he was blown away that he was the no idea. This was Are you frozen? And this is what's happened, and we'd love to have you come in. Did I freeze? Yeah, you froze. Freeze? Let me just check on the kids. One second. Hold on. Okay. Hey well, girl. Stop it. Maybe we can no. say it. Um no, but then they back. I told you, hour and 20 minutes. Make sure it's still freezing for me. Can but you see me? Yeah, Shit, same. No. we can see you, but now, now it's now better. It's okay. Yeah, now it's better. So, yeah, anyway, so that was that was a really sad. Yeah, but it's sad. still Ray was still, uh, you know, a big part of it. And I'm sorry for Ray. He was a wonderful dude, a total sweetheart of a man a really great dude and um i'm grateful for what he gave me and the working title currently is innocent people but a lot of times we've said you know we kind of sit around we're recording people we're like ray leota saved my life oh yeah ray you know like we laugh about like (laughs) and like even my buddy who's been helping he's like dude ray leota saved your life because through this i've learned so much more i've done so much more of a just a dive into being adopted. And I'd never really, you know, going into meeting my biological mother, I came in just like, Hey, da, 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 let's meet my birth mother. Then you learn some things and some things probably I stepped around, but I think this project has forced me to look more at things. And I mean, just riding around with, with DM with Daryl in Harlem, and I said, Daryl, what would you say to someone who was adopted and didn't want to look, knowing what it's done for you? Because you found out at 35, your parents hid it from you. You found mm. out. And knowing how big it is in your life now, Daryl, what would you say to people that, oh, I don't need to look, I don't want to, I don't need to. He's like, someone told me this and it's the best thing I've ever heard. He says, you never start a book on chapter two. So why <laughs> would you start your life there? I like that. Perfect. Thank you. I mean, it was it was brilliant. Like I couldn't believe Daryl just dropped that. I was like, yeah, I, I needed to know my chapter one. I needed to know how I got here, solve that mystery. What am I? What were my circumstances? So it was um, it was a you know with the Daryl interview it was a great interview, and there was a lot of uh, great stuff in there. But um, so here I am now, and I'm still working on the project still doing my photography and um, and getting more and more interviews. Now looking for a production company to help see around the bend. They have a little bit more money. I've kind of used all of my favors that I can. And now it's, um, I think it needs to get, I need to pass the ball off to someone who can kind of help get it over the goal line. But I've got so many interviews in the waiting, just waiting to go. I have a friend here in LA 
who I met. He was a twin in Korea and he was relinquished, South Korea, and they kept the twin. Hmm. So when he found his biological parents, he's like, ah, you kept the other one. And I was sent to California. So, and he's he's like, and I, I, he's like, I have only seen them on Zoom and I'd like to go there. And I would like to know how that informs his life. What happens there? Like, uh, you know, there's so many different uh, stories and they're all unique. And so many stories, Sarah and I talk about this all the time. Yes, well, we have them. We interview them. Including yours. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. I I have a question. Um, Did your sister find her Mm -hmm. biological parents? My sister um, doesn't have the desire. No, she um, doesn't. I don't know if it's she has no desire or maybe it's too hard to look at, but for whatever reason, she's not looking. So um, I have my ideas, but um, sometimes it's sometimes it's kind of tough to really dig in to get yeah. into that first initial bite of this whole thing and finding your. It's an upheaval, you know. It's a lot you go through, and yeah, um, Sarah and I both, you know, we kind of have learned through so many people, you know, you're always looking, even if you're not looking. Right. It's, it's a, except for people who don't know, obviously. Think, <clears throat> yeah. Even BJ Lifton says that. Mm-hmm. But, uh, the birth parent relationship can be complicated. I had a really complicated relationship with mine, my yeah. birth mother. Um, but my siblings, it was like different. I had, I felt, you know, no matter what, there was a I had a bond. I have a bond with them. Unfortunately, my birth mother died in 2009. Um, Do you have a bond with your biological siblings? Like, do you feel that kind of? Um, I don't know if I, I mean, we're friendly and it's great, but one's in Seattle uh, of my birth mothers, one's in Seattle, one's in Colorado. And no, I have not ever said, Hey, I'm going to take a weekend or spend a week and go hang out there. I see them when I'm on a job. Hey, can you meet me somewhere or something? I do do some traveling. Um, I, my, oddly, my half sister on my birth father's side, she has come to visit. She said, hey, I want to come visit. Sure. I mean, if anybody wanted to come visit, I would let them, like, no problem. Nobody's ever wanted to come visit. And I've never made that effort with my uh, siblings on my birth mother's side. But my birth father's side, uh, she came to visit and stayed with us for a few days and that, yeah, we have a pretty good, we're very similar. Yeah. So we have a good bond. Um, and uh, there was something else you mentioned. Oh, you guys, you uh, have you guys ever interviewed Betty Jean? I mean, uh, Lifton, did you ever? She, she, she died, but we, a while ago. I, I used to go see her. She was my, I would go see her in the nineties. I'd go get my adoption therapy from her. So, oh, wait, do you mean her or do you mean Nancy Verrier? Cause Nancy no. is in California. Nancy's in California. She's yeah. in Lafayette. I grew up in the town next to Lafayette called Moraga. And I actually yeah, called my birth mother hoping to get Nancy's info. Cause she's very hard to get a hold of. And I want to see if she'd be interested in giving her some, get some interviews on her. But she's got uh, she was part of a, a documentary that Rebecca Autumn did, did. It's called Reckoning with the Primal Wound. And it's oh, wow. It's it's a documentary about the primal wound. And oh, you, should check, you should check it out because um, yeah. yeah. Nancy is a big part of that. We interviewed Nancy. We and, did. Oh, that's um, great. That's on the great. podcast in the first season. Uh, oh, but cool. B- Betty Jean Lifton, I pretty sure died sometime Maybe, Maybe in the nineties. Okay. Well, I, I was seeing her 94, 95 in New York. She lived on the upper West side. I'd go to her apartment. She had just kind of, uh, written the book, uh, journey of the adopted self. And so I'd go see her. And then in New York, I'd go see another guy named Joe Saul. He's a great mm-hmm. guy. Joe Saul has a Wednesday night. It's called adoption. We, Cross we just Road. have our guest that came on today. sees Joe Saul. Oh, I saw so, him. Every yes. Wednesday night. She, she oh, Joe's. Released- yeah, that's funny. You would love Joe. He's incredible. So Wednesday nights, wow. upper Upper East Side, 72nd, and like first to have or something, you're up there. And yeah, so you you might have come out, you might have crossed paths with Carlina, our who was yeah. our 
Oh yeah. Who was our guest that the podcast that was released today. Yeah. yeah and wow. she, cause she would go on those Wednesday nights. Uh-huh. I, that, I was there. Yeah. Up until small adoptee yeah. community yeah. as it turns yeah. out. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So did your, did your, um, adopted parents, did they meet your biological mom and how any of that, like, are they still alive? How's all that? Um, my, my father has passed away and he was the most wonderful, loving human being I could have ever been given as uh, to have his parents and my Mm -hmm. mom, same thing. She's my spiritual guru, just incredible parents. They, um, and they're around my, my birth mother and her husband, and he has passed, but they met in Lafayette in Nancy's hometown, but they met for dinner. I think my biological mother felt a little, I think there might've been a little bit of a bull in a China shop type vibe, kind of like, well, now that I'm back in the scene, I think she kind of threw her weight around a little bit. It was a little bit hard for my mom to take. And I could tell for the first two years that my mom, that I and my birth mother were uh, in reunion. I think she was probably a little unsure of like, you're not sure what's going to happen. My son now meets his, his, you know, birth mother. And so I did, I, I reassured my mom. I said, mom, you're my mom. You're, there's nobody that's taking your place. You are, you are my everything. So she, I think over first, you know, maybe a couple of years and realized, yep, Jeff's not going anywhere. But I think she did feel um, that my birth mother was a little, well, when I was carrying him, this, this, and this, and oh, well, when he would do, you know, she kind of, I don't know. I, I think there's some, I know there's regret that she relinquished me. And I think she's like, hmm, that one was like, maybe I should have kept that one. And I think she's trying to get back or, you know, I think she was you well, know, trying to find her place probably in the, yeah, there too. Yeah. I'm so. sure she went through a lot of pain herself. And I mean, it, yeah. again, yeah. that era was maybe it wasn't really a choice. No, I don't think it was necessarily a choice, but it was, it was the lack of choice. Um, So I think uh, that's, you know, she has some, you know, some anger and regret there. And I, you know, I want to hopefully if she can let that regret go and, you know, let's, let's move on from where we're at, even though, you know, we can't cure adoption, but we can definitely do a lot of healing on it. So yeah. we can, you know, and there's a lot of people involved that have been hurt, you know, and as a, a great, a great friend of mine, uh, she's an amazing writer and you should have her on this show, Mindy Stern. She's here in LA. As she said, you know, in order to, you know, you have to break a family in order to form one through adoption. So you're breaking things. Right. Exactly. In yeah. order to put this together. And it's, it's really you know, there's a lot of healing to do with all of us and things. Well, we need, we definitely need re- adoption reform. I mean, you're one, of the, you're one of the lucky people who had a good life, but many people didn't. And, it, you know, and at the expense of, you know, why not put some resources into mm-hmm. helping that original family as opposed to paying, you know, $60,000 to get a baby, you know, there, there's a lot wrong with the system. So absolutely. Absolutely. Oops. And I like that you guys, about what you guys would like to eventually wait jeff you're frozen you're frozen again <laughs> am i there no, no you're there right. okay we start okay <laughs> get off the internet <laughs> hey guys i don't know no okay. worries that's why we have editing so yeah. so yeah. um <laughs> So tell us, start there where you were, we say, um, um, I like the, that you guys want to, I don't we're know talking about, oh. yeah. I like that you guys want to advocate for a healthier, more, uh, humane system of adoption that seems to, or maybe they're know, not adoption, but more, um, you know, maybe, I, I don't know that like totally changing someone's history and their name and all that stuff, erasing that past and fake yeah. birth certificates, you know, yeah. guardianship, you know, there's a lot of different 
different ways it could go. And let's get all 50 states, 18, you get all your records. Because when I went to CHS and I hadn't, when I went, I went there, came down from Chico one day to Oakland and the lady was holding all my info and she kept like, oh, no, nope, can't see it. And I, I was about ready to just reach <laughs> across almost like the department. that but i didn't i went the other way and I, I found a different way but it needs to be it needs to be uh revamped for sure the whole adoption process so um yeah i i would love to see that happen and you guys you know and anyway i can help with you guys doing whatever like i just want to see you. better yes you know better uh behavior in this adoption world so and I'm excited to see your project. I was just going to say the same thing. Excited to. Yeah, no, it's, um, it's been, it's been quite, uh, quite an amazing journey. And um, I'm also really impressed that you got to have therapy with Betty Jean Lifton. What a me gift. Too. I was thinking that while you were talking, I'm like, that's yeah, incredible. No. Well, my birth mother is very involved in she, Wait, stop. Are you pausing? Yeah. Her parents, Pacers. Jeff? Am I again? Yeah. Yes. I'm going to go. We're going right to travel. Wi-Fi. We're going to travel with you. We're traveling, guys. We're traveling. <laughs> I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to sit right here next to my. Yes. Let's see if this works. Um, but so- Pace. Tell, tell start where you were saying um, when I said yeah. uh, you Betty Jean Lifton and you said your birth mother. My birth mother is very involved in uh, Cub, which is Concern United Birth Parents, and she has been involved in Pacer. I don't know what Pacer stands for, but it's another adoptee group. And she has a friend that has a book of all adoptions from 1944 to 1974 or 80, something like that. Wow. I don't know how, I mean, it's like, are you sure? Like sometimes she goes, but I did give her a friend's info and she goes, well, this is the info you needed. And so like, like, we're in that book. Yes. Evidently we're in this book. It's like the, the book of Mormon, but we're in the book of adoptees. <laughs> you, know? you never know. I never even heard of this. Yes. And she's all in it. Um, You know, as much as I have to take everything she does and her behavior with a grain of salt, she is very involved in helping people find. And anyway, so I, I said, Hey, I'm going to try to do some therapy in New York. She said, why don't you go see Betty Jean Lifton? And so I went to her house, her apartment and I was very cool. Therapy sessions with her. So Back in 94, 95. Yeah. Wow. So, yeah. It was pretty cool. That's uh, really cool. Yeah. Yeah. I feel like we're in therapy, you know, with her right now doing the chapter, doing, so I'm breaking like, down her chapters. It's been and- great listening to you guys kind of review through those. So I, I love it. I really have really enjoyed it. Um, there's this other quote I have, this, there's another quote that I love that my friend Mindy did that I use, it's, uh, it, it says, my life is not better because someone adopted me. My life is different. Adoption can multitask. She has many things at once. So are we. We are the bastards, the unwanted, the surrendered, the saved, the chosen, the rescued, the loved, and the forsaken. Allow us our entirety. Oh, that's beautiful. That's I mean, a I love that. It's just, we can be everything. <laughs> The one thing that I sometimes when I listen to the podcast with you guys or other podcasts, um, some adoptees tend to think that it's all like the one thing there's there's no absolutes in yeah. this world. You can you could be 90 percent nurture, 10 percent nature. You could be totally the opposite way. You could have had horrible parents. You could have had amazing adoptive parents you know, your story doesn't mean it's the same for everybody else. So I, I love that quote there because it let, we, it's, it's such a vast amount of people can fit under this umbrella of adoption, uh, this, of the adoption constellation. We are, 
you know, it's not like I, there's, I, I don't know if you guys are on that. Hello, I'm adopted on Facebook. No, but someone just told me about this. Yeah. Good, bad or ugly. Sometimes, you know, sometimes the people that go into that, you know, you're not going to get the people that have all the happier adoption stories in there. They probably don't go into the chat rooms to complain. But a lot of people are convinced that there's nothing good about adoption or that adoption is at the very base evil or no, adoption exists because it needs to exist. And yes, some people misbehave when they feed, when, when you go to a soup kitchen, uh, 90% of the people need the food. 10% actually have jobs and just want free soup and they abuse it. I get it. Some people abuse the system, but it exists there because we need it. So, um, I, you know, the, the absolutes, I don't find absolutes in the world of adoption. It's some people have varying degrees of, of trauma towards it. Some have less. But it's unique though, if you, if we all get into a room, have you ever walked into a room with 25 adoptees? When no. 25 adoptees in a room? Fascinating. Because you're going to, everybody there, I know. Sort of, it's called Twitter. Yeah, that's what I was about to say. That's <laughs> oh, it's called, right. I don't know, anything, I didn't know what that was. I, you said there's an adoption. Adoptee Twitter. Twitter. My adoptee Twitter. It's, wow. Yeah, it's a community of adoptees looking yeah. to reform it and change yeah. it i would like yeah. to do the room of 25 though that in well, real yeah, life bring room. all the adoptee twitter <laughs> oh it's it's incredible because i you look around the room and i can tell you 95 percent of the issues you've dealt with i know and i probably let, let's reserve about five percent which can be a big five percent of your unique story louise or your unique story sarah but I can tell you a whole bunch of what you dealt with. And when you yeah. look in a room of, nine, of 25, 30 people and we're all like, yep, we've been there. Like it's a unique, amazing uh, story, a uh, uh, scenario, uh, a situation. And when people share their stories, it, if it can ring true as somebody out there that maybe was afraid to say something yeah. that felt like, oh, I, if I say this, I'll be shamed. Or if someone else can speak up and say it, it takes the power out of you. It takes the power that had over you and you become to have power over it. You know, it's, yeah. it's less controlling you. Oh, other people deal with this. I'm not the only one. Ah, shit. I got this. It helps you get through that and do the healing. You know, it's funny because I asked Daryl, I said, Daryl, did you ever think <clears throat> when you were, you know, the rap gods of the world and doing videos with Aerosmith that you were going to be so involved in, in uh, adoption? And he said, I had no idea, but I knew once I found out that I wanted to help others have a better, like I had wonderful adoptive parents, but a lot of kids don't. And I knew I wanted to get more involved in it. And I knew I wanted to get more um, to help other people that, you know, that didn't have the situation I did. And so, you know, I asked him, did you ever feel like, he said, no, I never could have seen it. And now here I am. And I am fully immersed in this world. And it's, it's just fascinating hearing him say, you know, I'm, I'm fully into this whole other world I didn't know exist. And um, yeah, it was just incredible. So really, really great. There was something I was going to say, but I think I forgot about the Daryl thing. What were we saying right before when you, I was saying something, um. Daryl in the car and shoot anyway it will come to me but it was it was really um it was really great to you know see the transformation of somebody and how it how does it inform your life what what becomes of you and if i hadn't found my biological mother i or found and then kind of put it away and didn't deal with it i wouldn't be here now dealing with the, you know, I feel like I've done so much work on myself and, oh, and with, you know, you know, and Daryl, sorry, back to what I was talking with Daryl, he was saying, you know, it used to be in the beginning when I found out, it was kind of like this Achilles heel that I felt that I, oh my God, I'm 35 and I just found out my parents were lying to me and I didn't know 
you know, really what to do. And I felt very vulnerable and he's been able to take it. And now he's like, no, it's my superpower. It's my superpower now. Now the thing that I used to be afraid to tell people or, or, or you know, for adoptees that knew from birth and didn't feel connected, it's something now that we can take and we can empower other people with it and create this group. We have this unique group of people. So I, I think by looking at the thing that you have that a lot of people might see as an Achilles heel, but if you can turn on it and turn that strength into a mountain, uh, that's the way to go with it. So it's, um, it's been an interesting, interesting journey and I still have more to go. So uh, as do we all for sure, yeah. always I'm feeling, this has been so great. We really appreciate your time yeah. and generosity and insight. I'd love to get that quote for if we could put it onto your show notes from her, her permission, oh, yeah. of course. Yeah, I'll, I'll send it to you. Okay. I'll send you, you know. It's beautiful. It made me cry. I'm an emotional day to day, but I'm like, that was beautiful. <laughs> yeah, no, it's, um, I, I really feel she sums things up really well. She's a great writer. She'll have, you know, when she put, I'll, you guys get turned on to her Mindy Stern. She's got really insightful adoption uh, stories there, but um, I will definitely send that to you guys and um, and maybe make an introduction to her. Yeah, that'd be great. Yeah, absolutely. I can do that as well. We can introduce you to Rebecca Autumn, who's close to Nancy. That would be great. And who has the documentary, mm -hmm. I should see. Oh, yeah. Absolutely. You really have to see. Yeah. So where's Rebecca Autumn? Is she in the East? She's on the East Coast. Yeah. Okay. East Coast. Are you guys aware of Reshma McClintock? She no. wrote a book called um, uh, 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 The City in India. She's a transracial adoptee from India to Seattle. And she was born in Calcutta and she wrote a book called Calcutta is my mother. She went back to find her birth mother, found a birth certificate, a death certificate. And she said, well, I'm just going to stay here and live here and do the things she did for six months so I can get her, get to know her that way. So she's an interview I'm trying to get. You guys should get it. She's in <laughs> Seattle. I'm trying to get her down to LA. She was supposed to do a book, uh, a book um, tour for her book, but then COVID. And I don't know when she's coming back down next. Sounds interesting. Thank you. But, yeah. yeah, really cool. And it's also interesting. I did do one other interview of a guy in Oakland and he was Chinese, gay and adopted. And I found it fascinating that I go... So what's the most, what was the hardest thing for you? He said, the hardest thing was being Chinese in our hometown. Second toughest thing was being gay. Down the list, maybe even third or fourth, I might have other ones, is being adopted. So it's funny how adoption is probably our number one thing that we deal with. But in our white privilege, that's our number one. Mm -hmm. But for other people, racism and all these other things that go well, on. Well, trans transracial adoptions yeah. being put into a white family is also oh. very difficult. Uh, yeah. That yeah. BJ Lifton talks about yeah. that in the book, and um, yeah. So that adoption and that are very intertwined. Yeah. He happened to be adopted to a Chinese family, but mm. still, he felt it was very tough in the town that we were in. But um, yeah. But uh, well, cool. That this is this has been great. Yeah, yeah. Really. thank you yeah. for your time. And I can, yeah, I'll send you, I'll send you some stuff and we'll, uh, we'll uh, be in touch guys. And that sounds you, good. Louise, if you come to LA, let's get coffee or I something. I love that. Or would come over that. for a, a glass of rosé at five. You I know, would love that. Whatever. We can talk, like, yeah. I, 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 yeah, I have my own reunion stuff going on. So I'll talk to you about that. <laughs> oh yeah, no, it's, it's always a joy. Oh, yeah, we, yeah. I definitely <laughs> felt like my birth mother came for two two days too long last time she was here. <laughs> like it was, yeah. Sometimes they they don't go so go so well. But yeah. Well, it's, thank you for your honesty and telling us your story too, and yeah. and just the time. Thank you. Yeah. yeah. Thanks, Jeff. Thanks for having me. Okay. All right, guys. Okay. See you. Bye. 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 Bye.